All right, so this is our day two of our algebra review. Uh, it starts with an opener, so you can go ahead and pause your video and try these uh, first three problems here and then check your solutions with me. All right, so the first one is solve the system algebraically. So we wanna be using substitution or elimination. Notice you have two equations with two variables. Um, if you look at them, the second equation is solved for y. It says y is equal to. If it's y is equal to or x is equal to, you want to use substitution. So we're going to go ahead and use substitution. We know that y is the exact same thing as 3x minus 1. So anytime we see a y in the first equation, which I see one right here, I can substitute in a 3x minus 1. Now I'm going to write my new equation. I have 3x minus 2 times the y value, which is now 3x minus 1. I'm putting it in parentheses since it's more than one term. If it was just one term, I'd still put it in parentheses. Equals negative seven. All right, so now we have to solve this equation. I'm gonna start by distributing my negative two. I have three x minus six x plus two equals negative seven. On the left-hand side of the equation, I notice I have like terms that I can combine. So I'm going to combine those. That's negative 3x plus 2 is equal to negative 7. I can subtract 2 from both sides. Negative 3x is equal to negative 9. Divide by negative 3, and I get x is equal to positive 3. All right, so now I want to go back to my original equations, and I can substitute the 3 back into either equation. I'm going to use the second equation since it's already solved for y. So I'm going to do y equals 3 times, I'm going to plug in my x value, 3 minus 1. So I get y equals 9 minus 1, which is 8. Now I can write my solution as an ordered pair, x comma y. So we have 3 comma 8. Now what I would like to do before I box it is check it in my first equation, which I didn't use to make sure that it is the correct solution. So if I plug in a 3 here and an 8 here, I should get negative 7. So 3 times 3 is 9. 2 times, sorry, negative 2 times 8 is minus 16. 9 minus 16 is negative 7. So it is correct. I feel confident boxing this. Hmm, or not. There we go. Okay. All right, next opener here. Uh, both of these are factor each completely, so we'll start with the first one. When factoring, the first thing we look for is a GCF. My coefficients are a 3, 12, and 15. All of those have a 3 in common. But also, if you look at my uh, other terms I have, or sorry, the values next to those numbers, I have an x cubed, an x squared, and an x. So everything has an x in it. This is x to the first power, so the least, the most amount I can factor out is just an x to the first power. All right, I'm going to go ahead and factor a 3x out of each, which is undistributing or dividing. So I get an x squared here, minus 4 times x here, and then minus 5 here. Now notice the directions is factor completely. So if you look inside the parentheses, this is still a quadratic right here, which is potentially still factorable. So now I have to see if this is factorable. With a, um, with a quadratic trinomial, I already took out the GCF, so I don't have to check for that. I'm using my organizational x. A times C is negative 5. B is negative 4. I'm looking for two numbers. When I multiply them, I get negative 5, and I add them, I get negative 4. That's negative 5 and positive 1. Divide by your lead coefficient, which is 1. I'm going to divide by 1, divide by 1, and now I can write my two factors. Don't forget to write the 3x first, and then I'm going to write these two factors. Remember, we're doing upside down here. So this is an x minus 5, and the other one is an x plus 1. Now, if you look what's left in the parentheses, those are linear terms, and I already took out the GCF. So... Um, those are linear binomials, I should say. Um, so there's not, they're not going to be factorable past that. All right, let's move on to the next one here. First thing I look for is a GCF. Coefficients are 1. I can stop right there, right? Because that means that the highest number that's going to go into all three is 1, and we don't worry about factoring that out. Now I'm going to look at, this is an x to the fourth and x squared, but there are no x's here, so they don't have any x's in common. So no GCF. I count the number of terms, and notice that there are three. So I'm going to use my organizational x to factor this. a times c, 1 times 12 is 12. b is 7. I'm looking for two numbers that when I multiply them, I get 12, and when I add them, I get 7. That's 4 and 3. Divide by our lead coefficient, which is a 1. And now, remember when you go to write your two factors, this is not an 
x plus 4, right, and an x plus 3, because these two terms must multiply to give me x to the fourth. So remember, if you're ever, ever having issues with knowing what goes there, it's your middle term, um, whatever is there. So this is an x squared and an x squared. That'll give you your x to the fourth. All right, so we still have um, quadratics left, so we're going to look to see if our quadratics are factorable. This is two terms. I should go like this. This is two terms. So I'm checking to see if it's a difference of squares, a difference of cubes, or a sum of cubes. It's not a difference, so that's out. So now I need to know if it's a sum of cubes. X squared is not a cube, either is 4, so that's out. So that means X squared plus 4, not factorable. Same thing goes for X squared plus 3. If this was an X squared minus 4, I didn't mean to delete that whole thing. I mean to delete that. It would still be factorable because that's a difference of squares. But we don't have that. So this is completely factored. Okay, so let's move on to the new material. So recall from Algebra 1 that i is an imaginary number and it's equivalent to the square root of negative 1. So if you ever see the square root of negative 1 in an answer, you want to replace that with i. Same thing goes with if you ever see an i squared in a problem. i squared is the square root of negative 1 squared because it's i squared. Remember, when you t square something, you multiply it by itself. So in other words, this square will cancel out, I'm air quoting there, that square root, and you get negative 1. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to solve some quadratic equations. Um, notice the directions on this. It says solve each for all, meaning real and imaginary solutions. All right, so we're going to start with our first one, okay? So when solving a quadratic, there are are several methods to solving a quadratic. There do, it does go from the most efficient way to the longest way. So the most efficient way would be if you could solve by square rooting. So what you're going to do is you're going to look to see if first off, if it's a quadratic, this is a quadratic. If there's just an x squared in it and not also an x, then you can solve by square rooting. So if you look at a, there's just an x squared, I can solve by square rooting. I can solve by square rooting. I cannot solve by square rooting. Furthermore, there's an x squared and an x. I cannot solve by square rooting. So let's start with the two that we can solve by square rooting so that we don't, so we can actually get into these two. All right, so if I'm solving by square rooting because there's just an x squared, you want to isolate that x squared. So I'm going to subtract three from both sides. Oh, this one right here just had an x squared. My bad, it didn't have an x squared and x, so they're all solvable by square rooting. All right, the first three, that is. X squared equals negative 9. All right, so now I need to solve this by square rooting. So when you're square solving the square rooting by square rooting, we want to account for both the positive and negative answer that will work. What I mean by this, let me give a separate problem right here, is that if I said I'm thinking of a number, and when you square it, you get 16. Most people will say you're thinking of 4. X has to be 4. But x could also be negative 4 because negative 4 times negative 4 is 16. So what we do when we're solving by square rooting is that to account for the positive and negative solution, we say that we square root and we have to make sure we do plus or minus. Okay? What I want to make sure everyone's clear on is that if I just asked you what's the square root of 16, it is not plus or minus 4. It is 4. Only when you're solving an equation and you put the square root in do you account for the positive or negative solution. All right, so back to this problem here. We put a square root in. We have to account for both the positive and the negative solution that will work. All right, so we have x equals plus or minus, and now I need to know what the square root of negative 9 is, okay? If it was the square root of 9, that's 3 times 3, so it would be 3. So positive 3 and negative 3 would both work when you plug it back in the original. But it's not a positive 9, okay? It is a negative 9. So I'm asking myself, what number do I multiply by itself to get negative 9? Can't do that. So if this was Algebra 1, we would say no solution. But we're past Algebra 1. We know that we account for imaginary solutions. So what I can do is I can break this up into the square root of 9, and the square root of negative 1, because the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 9 is the square root of negative 9. The square root of negative 1 is i, and the square root of 9 is 3. So this is 
3i. And don't forget that plus or minus because remember, we solved by square rooting. Okay, let's move on to the next one here. I just have an x squared, so I'm going to isolate it by adding 8 to both sides. x squared equals 8. And then we're going to go ahead and solve by square rooting. So we're solving by square rooting, so we have to account for the positive and negative solution. So I'm going to automatically write down x equals plus or minus. And now I'm going to see if I know this, or this square root of 8. Square root of 8 is... It does not have a nice answer because it's not a perfect square, but I can simplify it. So what I'm doing is I'm looking for my biggest perfect square that goes into 8. So I'm going to start listing my perfect squares off to the side. 1 squared I don't write down because 1 goes into everything. 2 squared is 4. 3 squared is 9. 4 squared is 16. Well, I already passed 8, so I can stop there. Right? So I'm going to look to see where 8 would fall. It would fall right here. And... That means that I don't need to check 9 and I don't need to check 16. They're too high. So I need to know if 4 goes into 8, which it does. So I'm going to say 4 is the biggest perfect square that goes in there. I'm going to write down how many times it goes in there, which is twice. And then you should always be able to simplify your first um, term right there. So the square root of 4 is 2. So this is 2 root 2. And don't forget your plus or minus that we wrote down beforehand. All right, next one. So the, at first, I looked at it, and I, I just saw this in my brain. I saw an x squared and an x, but that's not happening here. So I can solve this by square rooting. So I want to isolate whatever squared. So that's this right here. I want to isolate it. Okay, notice everything else doesn't have an x in it. If it did, I could not do this. So I'm going to subtract 3 from both sides. So now I have x minus 1 quantity squared is equal to 4. Now I can solve by square rooting because I want to get rid of that square, right? So I'm going to do square root plus or minus, square root plus or minus. The square root cancels out the square, and I just have x minus 1 equals. Don't forget your plus minus. Write it down right away. And now I'm asking myself, do I know the square root of 4? I do. It's 2. All right, now I can add 1 to both sides. And I have x equals, we're going to write this number first always, 1 plus or minus 2. Now, if that was a radical, meaning if this was root 2, we'd be done, we'd box our answers. But since it's not, we're going to keep going. We're going to be able to get our two answers right now. So we have 1 plus 2 is an answer, which is 3. And we have 1 minus 2, which is an answer, which is negative 1. So there is our two solutions, 3 and negative 1. Okay, let's move on to the last two in this section, okay? So I look to see if I can solve by square rooting. There's an x squared, but there's also an x here. So I cannot solve by square rooting. So if you can't solve by square rooting, the next thing that you want to try is to solve by factoring, okay? We spent some time on factoring already. You spent a lot of time in Algebra 2 on factoring and in Integrated on factoring. All right, so in order to solve by factoring, rule number one, it has to be equal to zero, okay? So this is not equal to zero, so let's get it equal to zero by adding 20 to both sides. x squared plus 9x plus 20, I forgot my x there, equals zero. So now I can try to solve by factoring. So you're going to look on the side that's not equal to zero, um, or that doesn't have a zero on it, and you are going to ask yourself, or you're going to factor it. Okay, so when factoring, first thing you look for is a GCF. There's no GCF. So you see how many terms there are. There's three. So we are going to make our organizational x, and we're going to try to factor it. So we're looking for two numbers that multiply to give us a times c, which is 20, and add to give us b, which is 9. So you ask yourself, do I know these two numbers? If you don't, it's not factorable. We move on to our last method. But we do know these numbers, 5 and 4. Don't forget to divide by a, which is 1, and now you can write your two factors. This is an x squared, so this is x plus 5 and x plus 4. Now you can use the zero product property that says this or this has to be equal to 0. So I can do x plus 5 is equal to 0 and x plus 4 is equal to 0. So now solve each one of those. x equals negative 5, x equals negative 4. And there are your two solutions. Okay. All right, last one here. So I see an x squared and an x. I cannot square root. So I say, okay, I'm going to try to factor. It has to be equal to zero. Done. 
So I'm going to try to factor it here. I'm going to make my organizational x. a times c, 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. b is 6. So I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to give me negative 1 and add to give me 6. It's not going to happen. So this is not factorable. That does not mean not solvable. It's qu all quadratics are solvable. Okay, so now we have to solve it. Our last, um, our last hope here is quadratic formula. Okay, you can use quadratic formula on every single problem. It's just the longest way. So you don't want to use it unless you have to, or at least that's my thoughts on it. All right, so I'm going to use quadratic formula to solve this. So let's remind ourselves of what quadratic formula is. It's the equation x is equal to, so this is how you find x. You're going to take opposite of b, plus or minus, the square root of b squared minus 4ac, all over 2a. So there's plenty of songs to help you memorize this. If you have to look them up on YouTube to help you memorize it, it's fine. But it must be memorized for the semester. We do get quadratics that you have to solve where it's not factorable and you can't solve it by square rooting that you have to use the quadratic formula throughout tests throughout the semester. Okay, so let's remind ourselves of what a, b, and c is. a on this one is 1, b is negative 6, and c is negative 1. All right, so we have x equals. We need the opposite of b, so negative 6, plus or minus the square root of b in parentheses, so 6 squared. Let's actually add that into the formula. Whenever I put in b here, I'm going to put it in parentheses before I square it. I'm going to put a and c in parentheses, and I'm also going to put a in parentheses there. All right, let's go back to our quadratic formula. So I'm at minus 4. I times the a value times the c value. So a was 1, and c is negative 1. And then all over 2 times a in parentheses, which was 1. All right, so now we have to clean this up. This is a process to clean this up. So what I like to do is I write x equals negative 6 plus or minus the square root of all over. And now I'm going to break it down, these, all of these numbers right here, to three numbers. So first I'm going to do 6 squared. 6 squared is 36. If it was negative 6 in parentheses squared, it'd still be 36. This first number should always be positive because you're squaring a number. Now the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply these three numbers. So I'm going to multiply these three numbers. Negative 4 times 1 times negative 1 is a positive 4. So I'm going to put down a plus 4. If this was also a negative right here, I'd have a negative 4. So I would write a negative 4 instead, but it's not. All right, last number you're going to clean up is this one right here. 2 times 1 is 2. All right, so now you have this. Next number you're going to clean up is you're going to add those two, or sometimes it's subtract, okay? x equals negative 6 plus or minus the square root of 40 all over 2. Next step is that you're going to simplify this radical, okay? So we're going to simplify this radical. I'm pushing off to the side so you don't look at anything else to, you know, say like, oh my gosh, what a crazy problem. It's not that bad. So I'm looking for my biggest perfect square that goes into 40, Right? So once again, I need my list of perfect squares. You're going to have to generate your list yourself. So I'll start again. 2 squared is 4. 3 squared is 9. 16. 25. And then when I pass 40, I can stop. I'm at 6 squared, which is 36. 7 squared, which is 49. I passed 40, so it's not 49. Okay. So now I'm going to go backwards, and I'm going to ask myself, do any of these numbers go into 40? Okay. Is it a multiple of? Is 36 going to 40, meaning 36 times what gives me 40? No, 36 doesn't. 25 doesn't go into 40. 16 does not go into 40. 9 does not go into 40, but 4 does. Okay. So I'm going to say 4 goes into 40, and then you're going to say how many times, which is 10. Then you're always going to simplify the number you got from this list. Square root of 4 is 2. So this simplifies to a 2 root 10. So I have x equals negative 6 plus or minus 2 root 10 all over 2. All right, the very last thing you have to do is you have to see if this is simplifiable. So to see if this is even more simplifiable, you are going to look at these three numbers. If there is any number that goes into all three of those numbers, then it's simplifiable. If there isn't, then you can stop box your answer. So if you look, all of these numbers are even meaning 2 goes into all of them, so I'm going to divide them all by 2. 2 divided by 2 is 1. 
2 divided by 2 is 1. Negative 6 divided by 2 is negative 3. So now I can write my final answer. x equals negative 3 plus or minus. I have 1 root 10. Instead of writing I have 1 root 10, you can just say you have a root 10, right? And then it's all divided by 1. We're not going to write divided by 1. We never write divided by 1 unless we're writing slope, right? All right, so there is our solution. Okay, the last thing we have to do today is we are going to simplify these four expressions here. So they all involve i, the imaginary number, and just so we realize when you have an imaginary number, it's in the form a plus bi. So if you look at just this one right here, 2 minus 5i, you have your real part first. This is your a value. And then minus bi. And this can be a plus or a minus right here. Okay, So that's how the form looks. You don't write the i first. You write it last. All right, so this one is easy subtraction. Okay, So I have to subtract this entire, two, the, both those terms right there. So what I like to do is I like to distribute the negatives. This is a minus 2. And this is a minus a negative 5, so this becomes plus. And so now I can just change it to addition because I distributed the negative. Okay. All right, if it was plus, I would just combine like terms. Since it's minus, I distributed the negative. So now I'm going to combine like terms. 6 and negative 2 is 4. And now I'm going to combine the imaginary parts. I just combined the reals. Now I'm going to combine the imaginaries. 3i and 5i is 8i. And there is your imaginary number. Right? That's not so bad. All right, let's move on to the next one here. So this next one is 2 plus i quantity squared. So before you do anything here, because I always say, hear people say distribute the square, there's no such thing as distributing a square. Okay? If I said I have 4 squared, what does that mean? You should tell me it means to multiply 4 times itself. Right? So if I see 2 plus i quantity squared, it means multiply 2 plus i times itself. So I'm going to write it out twice, and now I can multiply this out, okay? I'm using the distributive property. Sometimes teachers and students call it foiling. I just say I'm using the distributive property. So I'm going to start by distributing the 2 to everything in this uh, set of parentheses. 2 times 2 is 4. 2 times 2i is 2i. Now I'm going to distribute the i. i times 2 is 2i. I times I is I squared. Oops. A positive I squared, right? Okay, so I would combine terms, combine like terms right now, but before I do that, I notice I have an I squared in my answer. Recall from notes that we took moments ago, I squared is the same thing as negative one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replace the negative, or sorry, the I squared with a negative one. I squared is the same thing as negative one. And now, I can combine like terms. I have a 4 and a negative 1, which is 3. And I have a 2i and a 2i, which is 4i. So 3 plus 4i. All right, here we have some multiplication again. If you want to pause the video and try this one yourself, what we did moments ago. All right, let's see how you did. Distribute your 4. 4 times 4 is 16. 4 times 3i is 12i. Distribute your negative 3. Negative 3 times 4 is negative 12i. Negative 3i times positive 3i is negative 9i squared. I notice I have an i squared in my answer again. i squared is the same thing as negative 1. So this is the same thing as negative 9 times negative 1. So instead of scratching out the i squared and changing it to negative 1, I'm going to scratch off the negative 9 squared and change it to a positive 9, because it's the opposite of negative 9. Now I can combine like terms. 16 and 9 is 25. 12i and 12i cancel out, so my answer is just 25. Now the reason that 12i and uh, negative 12i canceled out, if you look at the original equation, they almost look identical, the two binomials, but, they're, but they have different signs right here. These are called conjugates meaning that the A term and the B term are the same. It's just that the signs separating them are different. When you multiply conjugates, the outer and inner term, which is, oops, I didn't mean to erase, the outer and inner term, which are these two terms, will always cancel out. 
All right, the very last one is a little abstract here. We have i to the 18th power, and I want to know what it's equivalent to, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to start by making a list here, and you're going to see what happens, okay? So recall we said i is the same thing as the square root of negative 1. i squared is the same thing as negative 1. So let's keep going. i cubed is the same thing as I cubed is the same thing as I times I squared, right? So all I have to do is multiply these two, or sorry, I can multiply negative one times I, because I squared times I, right? And I get negative I. This is negative I. I to the fourth, if I want to get I to the fourth, all I have to do is square I squared, so square negative one, and you get positive one. I to the fifth, you can do I to the fourth times I, right? So that's one times I, which is I i to the sixth, I can do i to the fourth times i squared, one times negative one, negative one, right? Notice what's happening here, okay? First off, we never write the square, we never, like, I should have this one switched, right? Uh, because we prefer i as an answer, so I'm going to put equals i over here. But if you notice the pattern, it goes i, negative one, negative i, one. I, negative 1, negative I, 1. That's what the pattern is going to be. So there's only four possible things that it simplifies to. So the fastest way to get I to the 18th, okay, instead of just keep going with the list, because what if I gave you I to the 507th power, is you take 18, and since there's four possible answers um, for these, either I, negative I, negative I, or 1, what you're going to do is you're going to divide it by 4, and then you're going to equate it to which one of these four it's equivalent to. And all you have to know is these four answers right here. Okay? So 16 divided by 4, or sorry, 18 divided by 4 is you have a remainder. That's fine. So I'm going to say, okay, 4 goes into 16 four times. Subtract that from there, and I get a remainder of 2. So I have a remainder of 2. So that means that this is equivalent to i squared, and I know i squared is equivalent to negative 1. So i to the 18th is also equal to negative 1. All right, that's it for today. You can go ahead and get started on tonight's homework.